thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. We didn't play the little jingle uh, this morning that, that I think we, we all like very particularly, but maybe we can play it later to help everyone wake up. Um, so I have the pleasure to, to give you um, a short overview and, and a very simplified view on, on, on what CAR T cell therapy is. And, and I want to start out with this uh, little cartoon here. Um, if the pointer works, we have only have one here. But Michel took the one that the only one that worked with him. <laughs> the pointer is working, but it's not. Oh, now we made a lot of advance here. Here we go. So what I wanted to show is that already in the, in the preclinical lab, we can see the potency of CAR T-cell therapy. And what I've put together here are data from um, in vivo models in mice, where we inoculate a tumor, and then either uh, leave the mice untreated, <clears throat> or we give them here three modalities of treatment. And uh, you can already tell which, which, which one the CAR T-cell therapy is. But just to illustrate that point, um, compared to other uh, treatment modalities that we have available <clears throat> in hematology and oncology, antibody treatments that are given multiple times, or also chemotherapy, you see that the only treatment that is really able to um, effectively treat an established cancer and reduce tumor burden and bring these mice into sustainable complete remission is the CAR T cell therapy, whereas <clears throat> um, in the same animal model, treatment with an antibody and directed against the same target, in this case SLAMF7, is uh, unable to delay tumor progression. And chemotherapy, and this is actually here lenalidomide, um, for treating multiple myeloma, is also just able to delay tumor progression, but not really effectively reduce tumor burden and bring these mice into a remission. And this already illustrates what the potency of this treatment is, where a single dose, a single infusion of this cell protein is able to essentially cure the mice. Of course, you've heard um, lots about, about uh, car receptors. Just to emphasize again, these are synthetic designer molecules that we essentially design on the computer. And uh, even though they, they use components that are physiologic, um, they're uh, assembled de novo and are really synthetic biology. <clears throat> So uh, CAR T cell therapy is a form of adaptive immunotherapy, and uh, adaptive immunotherapy has a long tradition in hematology, uh, going all the way back to uh, the use of bone marrow transplantation, which of course also instructed uh, this field. And I've here uh, shown the, the pioneer, uh, Professor Thomas, Nobel Prize laureate, um, who's the father of bone marrow transplantation, <clears throat> with the concept um, that uh, a sick uh, bone marrow um, is replaced with a healthy bone marrow from a compatible donor. And when the concept was, was developed in the 80s and 90s, um, the, the thinking was that, the, um, that uh, the, the intention was to give a very high dose of chemotherapy to reduce as many leukemic cells as possible, which of course would then also be toxic to the normal hematopoietic stem cells, such that the patient needed the bone marrow transplantation in order um, to reconstitute hematopoiesis. What was not known at the time, it was just being discovered that bone marrow transplantation was accompanied by a very strong immunologic effect called the graft versus leukemia effect. And one of the studies that um, um, also dissected this, this mechanism is a study from Mary Horowitz published in Blood in 1990 that, that showed when she compared uh, the, the source of this, this uh, transplant donor she found that with genetically identical twins, um, actually there was a much higher probability that these patients would relapse compared to those patients who did, um, had, had a non-related uh, donor and that suffered from acute and chronic GVHD. Of course, this GVHD also was, was um, an expression of the immune reaction that was happening in these patients, but it, um, of course, also, also correlated with this graft versus leukemia effect. So in the, at the end of the discussion of this manuscript, and I'll read this out to you, is a statement that is almost prophetic. Because it says, in summary, these data on the use of bone marrow transplantation provide evidence for anti-leukemia effects that cannot be explained by high-dose chemotherapy and radiation. And these activities may be mediated through several mechanisms. Advances in characterizing and controlling these effects are needed to improve results, and it may also be possible to use these effects to treat leukemia outside the transplant setting. And this is where we actually are today, so we are able to use immune-mediated effects outside the transplant setting to very effectively treat leukemia, for example with CAR T-cells. Another critical step in this evolution of adaptive immunotherapy is, is, was moving from this 
polyclonal um, reaction um, of the graft versus the leukemia effect, meaning there's many T cells, also other uh, cells, B cells, for example, involved that target many antigens. So another um, important step in this evolution was to, to ask the question, can we use an immune response that is essentially monoclonal and is, that is directed against a single antigen to treat a disease? And the key insights here came from the use of T cell therapy uh, to treat virus infections, also in the context of uh, bone marrow transplantations, where patients, for example, if they were CMV positive and then transplanted from a CMV through a negative donor that uh, did, did not have memory T cells uh, against this virus, um, suffered from uh, viral infections. And Stan Riddell, one of the pioneers that you've, that you've heard uh, speak uh, two days ago, um, he was the first to show that if you now uh, generate in the culture dish uh, CMV-specific T cell clones and adaptively transfer them into the patient, you can reconstitute immunity to this antigen. Hermann Einzeler, my department chair in Würzburg, was the first to then also show this concept in a, in a center in Europe. And, and still today, we, we do treat uh, patients that suffer from viral infections, not only CMV, but also other viruses with T cell infusions. So adapting this concept now to, to tumors, it is um, uh, isolating from the endogenous repertoire T cells that were recognized tumor associated antigens um, has been challenging because uh, what is different from viruses is that for tumors it is not so certain whether these are really foreign or not. And as such, it is not easy to find in the endogenous T cell repertoire repetitive, repetitively T cells that can recognize tumor antigens with high affinity because often these tumor antigens are derived from self-antigens and highly active T-cells are deleted from the repertoire during a thymic selection. And this is why the field um, in the end ended up uh, designing synthetic receptors that would re redirect the specificity of a T-cell to these tumor antigens. What is given here is a comparison between what the T-cell receptor looks like and the chimeric antigen receptor. So the T-cell receptor, which is kind of the um, physiological kind of blueprint of what a receptor should look like in order to adequately stimulate a T-cell. Um, it's a heterodimer, an alpha and beta chain, and it <coughs> recognizes an antigen in the context of MHC. And there's a whole signaling complex that is uh, kind of translating this, uh, this recognition of the target antigen into a signal that stimulates T cells. So this has been, try been tried to emulate with this uh, synthetic receptor. Um, the difference here is that the targeting domain is, uh, in most uh, car designs, derived from an antibody. So it's the variable heavy and light chains of this antibody are brought into a single chain variable fragment format. Uh, so they're fused by a linker. They're put then into what we call a space room, a domain that provides reach and flexibility such that the car can bind to the antigen and it's then coupled to the signaling machinery. What has been done with these receptors is to essentially integrate the two signals that cars need in order to, or that T cell needs in order to get really properly stimulated into one molecule so it provides the CD3 Zeta activation signal uh, together with the co-stimulation signal. So the reason also for why, why uh, antibody binding domains are used are such that, again, it's often not possible to find in the endogenous T cell um, or even B cell repertoire um, reactivity against self-antigens. So typically what is done is that you take the human uh, protein, the human uh, protein coding for this tumor antigen, you immunize mice or rabbits that would then mount an antibody response to this human uh, antigen. You uh, generate a hybridoma. Um, sequence this in order to, to get the amino acid sequence for the very heavy and light chains um, and then you make a synthetic gene encoding this entire receptor. So this, uh, this concept um, first called T-body um, because essentially you're bringing an antibody onto a T-cell. It's first described by Eschar in the late 80s. Um, I've talked about how the car integrates signal one and two, and um, what you can already um, appreciate here is what is different from targeting um, peptide MHC complexes um, that have kind of a very fixed format. So the geometry of how uh, TCR-restricted T cells and target cells uh, interact is very fixed. With cars, there's uh, much more flexibility because uh, depending on which tumor antigen you target, they have, may have different conformations in the particular epitope that you're trying to go after, maybe hidden in the three dimensional structure of this protein and such, um, we found you, uh, the, modulating the design of this car, especially in the, in the spacer design, to provide enough reach and flexibility to bind the target antigen is critical because, again, the 3D conformation of, these, of how these target epitopes are located can be distinct um, between uh, different car antigens. 
This is shown here. Um, so we've spent quite a bit of time of, of trying to, to find uh, algorithms of how to best uh, to design these car receptors. And uh, again, we found these uh, extracellular spacer domain to be uh, critical in order to get uh, good CAR T cell function. What has been done in, uh, from, th from the very beginning in CAR design is to use actually the, the constant domains of antibodies, the FC portion, um, to, uh, to derive spacer domains and anchor the CAR receptor in the T cell surface with the challenge that of course these FC um, receptors or FC motifs would be recognized by macrophages um, monocytes um, that have uh, that express FC binding receptors and would uh, get deleted. And this is shown here. So if we use a, a conventional spacer design that harbors the FC motifs, then the efficacy of these CAR T cells in, in this in vivo model is uh, very low, and the mice die from progressive lymphoma in this example. If you modify these uh, the, and, and delete these FC motifs, you can rescue the reactivity and cure all the mice. And this is just to illustrate that the difference between the two receptors that were used in the left and the right treatment group is just in four amino acids, yet they make a difference between complete treatment failure and all mice die and um, a significant treatment success in rescuing all these mice. And this is just done by four amino acids in this entire CAR molecule. Here's again uh, shown this, this, this evolution of how the, the CAR designs developed over, over uh, almost two decades. Um, so the first uh, CAR receptor, first generation CARs only included the CD3 Z motive. The very early designs had also used other components of the T cell receptor complex, CD epsilon, etc. But CD3 Z is the one that proved to be most effective. Then in the, the second wave of, of CAR designs, the co-stimulation was included, and it's always included N-terminal to, to CD3Z in order to ensure binding of molecules that are part of the signaling cascade, like ZEP70, and so on. Um, third generation cars have been designed with the idea of that, that, that adding more power to this co-stimulatory capacity was important. I'm not sure if, you know, um, with the latest insight that we have in car signaling and signaling strength, um, whether this concept will really hold up. Um, Maybe in some cases even that um, because CD28 provides a very strong signal, form BB is a little weaker and if you now couple this, you also of course compromise how certain adapter molecules can uh, bind uh, to, to these individual domains that you actually get a weaker signal, which we've seen throughout the meeting also can get you in the end better CAR T cell functional output because these T cells are, are less prone to activation and you saw that another phenomenon. There is um, another concept, um, it's called the, the truck uh, concept, and you've, you've heard Henrik Abken present on this, with the idea that, um, that you use active, the activation signal that is provided by the car, and it typically um, ends up in the um, induction of transcription factors, like NFAT or NF-kappa B, that you use uh, these transcription factors to trigger expression of a second, um, second output um, with an NFAT inducible promoter um, that, for example, triggers expression of a cytokine. The first example was provided by interleukin-12, and we've heard yesterday that other cytokines like interleukin-18, IL-7, etc., are under investigation. And this is the truck concept where the primary signal from the car triggers another effector function. This can be secretion of cytokines, that can be also secretion of other secondary functions like the production of fusion molecules that neutralize PD-1, etc. So I think uh, there's a whole new wave of novel car designs um, already um, in the literature. There's probably more car designs coming, and I think um, with the fourth generation or truck concept, kind of this nomenclature has already or, or almost stopped because you can, you can of course count, um, I don't know, probably up to 100 already um, if you just go through the literature and enumerate and list all the car designs that have been proposed. So here's uh, again summarized the mechanism of action. So when, when the CAR T cells see antigen on target cells, um, what they start doing is, at least the killer cells, they start uh, producing and releasing cellulitic um, uh, granules, perforin and granzyme that essentially damage the cell wall of the target cells. So it makes little holes in there. And this is then part of the um, apoptosis cascade that these tumor cells undergo. 
Another key effector me mechanism is the release of cytokines, some of which, for example, TNF-alpha, have an immediate um, uh, toxic effect on target cells, or other uh, cytokines like interleukins that recruit other immune cells into this response, and this can be cells from the adaptive or the innate immune system that uh, add more power to this uh, immune response. And we've heard the uh, discussion about epitope spreading, because then suddenly there can be also T cells that recognize other relevant antigens on tumor cells and that amplify this response. Ideally, and, and this is a unique feature of this, this living drug in cell therapy, is that these CAR T cells, um, once tumor has been cleared and they're still fit and still around, they can enter into the memory pool and potentially persist for months and years and protect the patient from relapse. So it's very clear, so if you look at the, the, the set of effector functions that this treatment is different from conventional chemotherapy, radiotherapy, also surgery, um, but most importantly, most of the mechanisms of action of chemotherapy, this treatment is very different, and this also explains why in patients that are resistant or refractory to conventional treatments, these CAR T cells can still be effective because they have a completely different mode of action. So CD19 is the paradigmatic um, antigen uh, for CAR T cells. We've heard uh, yesterday that it is attractive um, <clears throat> because it is expressed um, on B cell precursors, also mature B cells. Um, and if you look at the, the hematologic malignancies that derive from the B cell lineage, of course there's different stages where malignant transformation can occur. Um, early during B cell development for the acute leukemias, probably more um, from mature B cells for the, for the lymphomas and, and CLL, for example, and then all the way down to plasma cells with Waldenströms and multiple myeloma. And of course, if these, um, this malignant transformation occurs, the resulting disease retains expression of CD19, and this is why it's essentially a universally expressed target antigen in B cell malignancies, with the exception of multiple myeloma, because often here the cells are then at a stage where they also start to downregulate this. CD20 is an alternative antigen, but it's not as um, um, universally expressed, and um, it's also of different um, antigen density, which we also heard is important for CAR T cells in order to exert the reactivity. So this is why in B-cell leukemias, B-cell lymphomas, CD19 uh, has been the paradigmatic antigen. And the other uh, interesting feature, of course, is that the expression of CD19 on normal tissue is very well described. It's very predictable. It's normal B-cells that, as an anticipated side effect, will also get deleted. And the resulting B-cell depletion is an indicator that the CAR T-cells are effective and work. Um, the consistent uh, B-cell depletion is also an indicator, essentially, that your CAR T-cells are still around. And what um, happens in, in, uh, as a consequence is that the, the antibody levels uh, go down. It's hypogamma globulinemia, which is being addressed by um, replacing um, the, these antibodies with um, serial, usually monthly, uh, IV infusions of uh, polyclonal immunoglobulins to protect the patients from infection. So here's a summary of how the CAR T cells are um, uh, usually produced. Uh, the starting material typically is a leukophoresis uh, that the patient undergoes. Um, from this leukophoresis, T cells are isolated um, with different methods. Typically, it's any um, immunomagnetic beads that you use to pull out either all the T cells or the killer and helper cells. There's also protocols uh, that take all the PBMCs and go directly to the step where we activate the T cells with beads. These beads um, typically engage CD3 and CD28 to bring these T cells into activation um, to make sure that the, the chromatin is open and the T cells are receptive to the uh, genetic information that is provided typically by viral gene transfer vectors. Um, there's usually an expansion step to, to amplify the T cells and this is uh, in, in most cases basically um, the, also part of this activation that these beads provide. Um, usually this is anywhere between one and two weeks that these T cells are highly activated and proliferate and then enter, enter into plateau phase at what time you remove these magnetic beads because you don't want to infuse them into the patient and uh, you then formulate your infusion product. Um, <clears throat> what is done in, in most protocols is that you administer a preparative ch chemotherapy regimen in order to create space for these, these CAR T cells and uh, promote the release of homeostatic cytokines like interleukin-15 and others that uh, promote the engraftment of these T cells once they enter into the bloodstream in the bone marrow and increase their persistence and in vivo proliferation. There's um, 
a lot of movement in this area because obviously making these living drugs is different from all conventional um, treatments that we know in hematology. Um, so the question is, are we using autologous, and this is the vast majority of our T cell products are obtained from, from patient T cells. They can be of donor origin if patients underwent allergenic bone marrow transplantation, but still it's a personalized um, HLA matched cell product for these patients. Um, there's also a lot of interest in making allergenic uh, CAR T cells from third-party donors with the idea that you essentially have <clears throat> a more universal supply of these cells and can bank these cells and don't have to wait for the patient to come in and do uh, the leukophoresis. But there's uh, several hurdles related to immunogenicity of these cells because they're not uh, they're completely HLA matched and will ultimately get rejected. And of course, um, of identifying these super donors where you derive these allergenic CAR T cells from and address batch to batch variations, these are the critical issues here. This is why still today the state of the art is using autologous CAR T cells. Also seen uh, in the industry session yesterday that um, most of the companies that commercialize these cell products go for centralized manufacturing, so they build a plant um, <clears throat> that is logistically in a, in a, in a, in a, in a located such that you can receive the leukophoresis, make the cell product and ship it back in a reasonable time. However, this is of course a significant effort of maintaining such buildings, having highly trained personnel uh, on site. So this is a significant investment that has to be done. And this is why there is interest in doing on-site manufacturing. Um, and we've seen some of the, the opportunities, for example, on the Prodigy platform and how this could be implemented as an on-site manufacturer in the hospital. Viral versus, versus, versus free gene transfer is also an area of interest. Most of the CAR T cell products use retroviral or gamma, uh, lentiviral gene transfer vectors. And of course, it's a lot of effort of making these viral batches. They are associated with a high biosafety level. And if you can reduce this by just using DNA vectors, that would be a major uh, ease to this. And this is why we and others are investigating this. What is shown here again is this, how this leukophoresis works. Uh, Halvard Bönig will, will tell you more about this in the, in the afternoon. Um, and there's uh, just an illustration here of how the CAR T cells grow. There's these wave bioreactors, for example, where the T cells are in a shaker, which is also to, to promote uh, gas exchange and nutrient supply while these T cells expand. An important uh, point I want, want to make is cellular composition of, of CAR T cell products. So with the uh, easiest approach of just taking PBMC, stimulating them with beads, letting grow out whatever grows out, um, you get a lot of <clears throat> variation in the final infusion product because you cannot exert control over whether there are killer cells, helper cells, naive memory cells, even T-Rex, going into proliferation, taking up the gene transfer vector and ending up in your infusion product. And this is also illustrated by the study published by Renier Brentians a couple of years ago where he showed when he looked at the composition of <coughs> CD19 CAR T cells, um, there was a, a lot of variation um, you know, in the composition. Even when we just looked at the killer cells and helper cells here, some products contain almost only helper cells, like the CLL3 uh, product. Other cells, uh, products were more evenly distributed. And the implication of this is, of course, that because killer cells and helper cells have different, um, also, modes of action, immediate lytic activity for the killers, more cytokine production on the helper cells. Um, these cell products will then differ in their engraftment kinetic, in the pharmacokinetic with which they expand and reduce tumor, but most importantly they will also differ in the kinetic of uh, which cytokine release syndrome and other side effects occur. And This is why it is desirable um, to formulate uh, cell products such that they have a defined composition such that the pharmacokinetic is more consistent and predictable. Um, a key experiment in, in doing this was performed by Stan Riddell's uh, group where he looked at uh, in the um, memory compartment whether different T cell subsets would have uh, distinct attributes that would inform selection of any of these subsets for use in a therapeutic cell product. And what he did is he uh, um, sorted central and effector memory cells, and this can be done um, by differential expression of CD62L, and infused uh, T cell clones that were derived from either the central or the effector memory pool into macaques. And he could show that with, when the T cell clones were derived from central memory, he could detect these, these clones in, 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 in monkeys for months, and some of them for years, whereas when the T cells were derived from effector memory, they rapidly disappeared. Um, and this, this tells you that if you have 
have more uh, of either of these subsets in your CAR T cell product, you also get a different pharmacokinetic and persistence profile of these cells. And in most uh, CAR T applications, you of course want kind of this central memory um, outcome where the CAR T cells persist for months and years, so you can protect your patient also from relapse. Of course, for some products that are new and you really just want to test whether it's reasonably safe to address a novel target, you might also be interested in this effective memory uh, phenotype, although uh, probably all of us would uh, rather go for the central memory um, option here. So we've, we've been wondering if uh, can you use these insights to formulate cell products of optimal uh, T-cell subsets and um, the, the key experiment is, is shown here where we treated mice inoculated with Raji lymphoma. If you don't treat them at all, they rapidly succumb to uh, rapidly progressive lymphoma. Rather than you treat them with uh, here uh, a random composition cell product just derived from PBMC where you don't exert control over what is in there. Um, you can exert a significant anti-lymphoma effect but you cannot cure the mice because they cannot, these T cells cannot keep up with the rapid growth of this cell product. Michael, can you conclude? I will. I will just finish this and then we're at the end. Um, and here, in, in, when, we, when you then define the cell product of your optimal subsets, central memory cells and uh, naive, uh, CD4 naive cells, which we found to be the strongest helpers, you can cure these mice because um, they have uh, superior engraftment um, abilities and in vivo expansion. And this is a concept that has also been taken forward with some of the CAR-T products that uh, we've talked about at this meeting. So I have a few more slides. Um, that we can actually then focus more in, in the repeat session of this uh, in the afternoon, um, where we then would focus on, on, on toxicity um, associated with CAR T cell therapy and some suicide genes and rescue mechanisms. And uh, with this, thank you for your attention. So thank, thank you so much for this nice uh, overview. There's room for one or two very short questions. Please go ahead. Um, Michael, anything about... Um chemokine um, expression and how the cells migrate to the different uh, tumor sites. Is there any possible control on this aspect? Yeah, that's a very interesting point, um, especially when, you know, thinking about bringing CAR T cells also to uh, um, indications in oncology, expression of chemokines that uh, may facilitate them facilitate their migration, it's of significant interest. I think there's uh, studies coming out on this where the chemokine profile is being assessed and there's also a lot of effort in expressing certain uh, chemokine receptors in order to promote migration to an invasion into tumor lesions. So this is an area that is clearly coming and it's also supported by our ability to put in more genetic cargo into these T cells with uh, vectors that can harbor not only the CAR gene but then also maybe an additional uh, chemokine for example. Thank you, Michael. I would like to thank you and uh, hand over to Raf.